This video is for the very beginners. We're gonna learn about variables, what they are, how to use them, what functions are, and also what an API is and how to use it. All right, to kick things off, let's go and start with making a file. Make sure you have a file just called whatever you want and have it in with .lua. In VS Code, I'm also going to open up a terminal so we can actually execute this code without needing DaVinci. So we're gonna come over here. Oh, don't, don't worry about that. We're gonna come over here. You might see like a whole taskbar right there. I'm gonna come over here to terminal, new terminal, and you're gonna have this pop up over here. Navigate to wherever you've saved your file to. So I have mine on the desktop. So I'm just gonna do for Windows, it's CD desktop. Let's extend it out so you can see it. it's a little better. So we can see we are going to CD desktop. This is just going to the directory desktop. And then we want to first figure out what Lua version we have. If you've just recently installed it, you may already know. If you haven't, make sure you go ahead and install Lua. I'll actually put a video down below to explain how to install it because it can be a little confusing for Windows, for example. But depending on how you installed Lua, you're going to need to actually call it in a different way. If you've installed it just without any extra stuff, you're going to be able to do just Lua 54 if you have just installed the newest version, version 5.4. And this is how you're going to call all the Lua files that we're going to be using today. Otherwise, if you just type in Lua and you get an error, that's how you know that you need to use a version number after the Lua call. If you've installed it in a very fancy way, you may be able to use Lua, but I didn't install it that way. I'm not going to bother with it. So if you just type in Lua 54 and then type in the name of your file, we're going to type in learn Lua.Lua and press enter. It's going to run the file. There's nothing in the file, so nothing's actually going to happen. But let's go ahead and put this over back to the side so we have a lot of room over here. And whenever we want to run this again, we can just now press the up arrow and that will just enable us to relaunch that exact same command. Great. We're going to start off with talking about variables. What is a variable? Very basic terminology, it is a word assigned to something. It can be either assigned to a string, a number, or a boolean. It can also be assigned to what a function will return to you. And I'll explain that here in a little bit. So let's say if you see a word, let's say apple, and then equals, and then literally anything like a string or something, this right here is your variable. Like I said, variables can be assigned to strings, booleans, or numbers. This is a string, this is a boolean, true and false, and then a number, as you can guess, it can be a one, it can be a four, it can be a 10, it can be a billion, or it can be 3.4, whatever you want to type in there. So numbers in Lua aren't like other languages that you may have experienced before, to where they're separated out in integers and floats, float being decimal, integer being whole numbers. Those are just categorized as the same thing, just as numbers. So what's going on with this little squiggly line right here? Let's break it down a little bit further and actually talk about the two different kinds of variables you can have, a global and a local variable. Local is this locked in specifically to the place that it was created. So if it was created in a function, you can only use that variable in that function. If it was made in an if statement or a loop, or whatever, it is locked into the place it was made. A global variable can be accessed anywhere in the file. Or if we're working in a multi-file system, which DaVinci Resolve doesn't support, you can actually access that variable in other files. By default, everything is assigned as global. Even the variables that don't have a capital like this, even though it is best practice for global variables to start with a capital. But if we look, my NLE VS Code actually tells me, hey, your global variable is missing its initial uppercase. If we change this to a capital A, that little squiggly goes away and this is now, as we can see, it is a global variable assigned to the number of 3.4. If we instead keep this as lowercase and put a local in front of this, now this is a local variable assigned to the number 3.4. If we wanted to instead have this still be global, we could do underscore capital G dot and then apple and assign this to something. And this now is a global variable with that lowercase uh, first letter. However, you don't really want to do that because yourself in the code later is not going to really appreciate that. For best practice, if it's a local, you'll want it to be lowercase. For best practice, if you want it to be global, you should have probably have it be uppercase. So the best way that you actually go about doing that is doing this. And now this is easily identifiable later on in the code as a global variable. Special thing about local variables and anything local that's inside your file, it's easy to tell when they're being used because they'll have this little grayed out look to them, at least in VS Code, maybe in other editors it's like this too. It'll have this nice little grayed out look to them. So if we then use this later on and assign this to something, we can see it's still not being used. Both of these are still grayed out. If we then check with an if statement or something like this, if apple is equal to four, now we can see it is being used, but this if statement isn't being actually ran because nothing's inside of it. So we can just say print 
uh, invalid. And now we can see everything is being used, everything is bright and colorful. Super cool, super easy to see in VS Code. If you're curious about the extension I'm using, if you go down here to extensions, I'm just using the first one that comes up when you type in Lua. It is literally this very first one. Use it, it's fantastic, it's super basic, but it gets the job done. So now if we were to run this, we'll actually see nothing's gonna show up in our console because Apple equals three, not four. If we change this to be three, then, we, then we're gonna see it's gonna print the word invalid in our console right here. So I said before that functions can be assigned to variables and let's take a look at that. So if we assign a number first off to let's say four, and then let's create a function. We can also make functions local or global just the same way as variables because these are essentially the same sort of idea. So we'll just say local function and then in VS Code we can just tab to autocomplete. Right here where it leaves our cursor, you wanna type in the name that you wanna to assign to this function. So we'll just say square, so because we want to square the number that we wanna put into this. And in fact, let's put in num for number, or you can put in fold number, it doesn't matter. And then a special thing about functions is you can return something back to the place it was called to. So if we come down here and make another variable and we just say squared, if I can type today, number, and assign it to the function of square and then put in number in here, this will give us something if we put in a return operator in here. So let's put in return and then let's actually do an operation right here next to return and this is going to then return the result of this math equation. So we'll just say num times num. We can also do this assigns to a variable so we can just say result and then assign it to num times num and then just use the result as the return. This may be more readable, but it also is a little bit more lines of code. It depends on whatever you want to really do. So now if we were to just print to the squared number, we're going to get the square version of our number four. So we should see 16. And if we run the file, we're going to see it prints out 16. All right, that's pretty cool. So functions can return a result to us, do an operation for us, and we can put something into them. That's really handy. And they can also be global or local, just like variables are. Now, what about APIs? When API is essentially just a way for you to connect to a website, software kind of situation. There's other situations for it, but we'll just stick with software for this video. In our case, DaVinci Resolve allows you to connect to them to do various tasks like things on the edit page and do things in Fusion and other things kind of like that. It's basically you use a function that the creator of the software gives you and it will do a task. You can give it some things to pass into it, like you can give it a number, you can give it like a string, you can give it a boolean, you can give it all sorts of stuff, and then it will do based off of what you just told it to do. These are not functions that you could make yourself. For example, you could not append stuff to the media pool yourself with just raw Lua code. You still need the API to do that. We cannot access the inner workings of the code. We require the API to connect and, and communicate back and forth with us. So not only can we send stuff to the API and have it do stuff for us, but we'll also send information back and we can then use that information for other stuff with the API or just with regular Lua text in our code. For example, we can use a command that will give us back a Boolean true or false and we can just say, hey, if this was successful, then let's continue. Or if this was not successful, let's throw an error and then return so we don't continue on with the rest of our code. That's also something very important to know is returns not only will return something to the call of whatever function or wherever it was called, but it will also end whatever happens below it. So return is always the last thing that should be in a function, for example. Or if it's an if statement, it'll actually cancel the code after the if statement. It'll just stop everything else from happening. So in DaVinci Resolve, why are there two APIs? You may not have known this before, but there are actually two APIs in Resolve. It's really weird. There's the DaVinci Resolve API and the Fusion API. Why are they different? Well, way back in the day when Resolve was first created, it was basically just a coloring program. It was like to color your footage and that was it. It was a fantastic program for that, but it didn't have many other features beyond that. Then they slowly expanded and grew the company and grew the software, and then they realized we need to actually have a motion graphic VFX, you know, After Effects replacement in our software. Another company, Ion Software, had the software Fusion. Now Fusion was created in about 2006 and over that time it had developed its own API, which is a very powerful, very big API that can do a really lot of stuff. But 
When DaVinci Resolve purchased Fusion from Ion Software, they took in the Fusion API, didn't touch it much ever since then, and haven't even updated the documentation ever since they purchased it, at least to my knowledge. After DaVinci Resolve purchased Fusion, they eventually realized, okay, we need to actually have our own API. And in Resolve version 15, they eventually released the first versions of their API, which included some basic stuff for like the edit page and media pool and simple stuff like that. I actually couldn't find the original readme file, but I'm sure it's out there somewhere if somebody knows what the first functions were. That'd be really fascinating to learn. But they never fully incorporated the two APIs together. And to this day, they don't fully document the Fusion API with the Resolve API. They're still completely different. They work completely differently but they still kind of communicate si simultaneously. However, they are still separate. And you'll notice that when making different kind of plugins like workflow integrations, because those only have the Resolve API built into them. Originally, the scripts for Fusion were actually made with their own kind of script language, which was like a .script lib file. However, with the introduction of Resolve's API, they allowed for the bridge with Python and Lua to actually able to communicate all the code into the software all at the same time with just that one language. Now, the script lib files were essentially Lua files anyway, but with this, they were able to fully incorporate other languages and also incorporate being able to use the actual file extension. So it's much easier for the average user to get into it. All that being said, how do we use these APIs? The DaVinci Resolve API can get started with just typing in a simple thing of local or global resolve. And once again, this is a variable, so you can assign this to whatever you want. You can just assign this to app get resolve. Now, why is it this? You may also sometimes see it as just resolve. The app get resolve is is able to work for free and studio. Just doing Resolve works in studio. So if you want to be able to actually use this in a free version of DaVinci, then use this. And this is the starting point for all Resolve scripts. This is the Resolve object that holds the entire API inside of it. So now to continue on, you can do something like local project manager equal to Resolve git project manager. And this will then get you the project manager, which is going to be able to allow you to find which project you're in, whatever folder you're in in the project manager, get the media pool for the project you're in, get the timeline that is active in the project you're in, and all sorts of other stuff down the line. It is a branching path from this resolve object that is able to break out into many different things for you to easily access a bunch of stuff from resolve. Now, there's a downside for this. Since it was only created in 2018, it's only had only a few years to actually grow into develop as an API. So we do have to give them some slack. It's not like they're just not wanting to work on it. Now they have a lot going for them, but since the Fusion API has been around since 2006 or 2007 area, and it kind of stopped being developed around 10 years ago, there's a lot of time that that has had to develop versus the like six years that the Resolve API has had to develop. So we definitely need to give them some slack. They are still working on it. There's probably a lot of stuff behind the scenes that needs to be checked, make sure it all works, make sure everything is functioning. They also don't know what people were exactly wanting, I'm sure, so they don't need to put the time into stuff that they don't know people will actually use. I will say, if you're watching anybody from who works at Resolve, we would appreciate the ability to cut clips on the timeline. That'd be fantastic. That may be hard to implement. I don't know the inside workings of the code. Let me know if that's not possible, but I would love that to be a feature. <laughs> a lot of people have been asking for that, so I don't know, just something I would like to see. But anyway, back to the actual important stuff. What about the Fusion API? Similarly to how we get the resolve object, we can also get the fusion object with a local fusion equal app get fusion. And we can also do the exact same thing from before and just do the fusion call just like this. You're gonna see a little error here. Don't worry about that. As long as you launch this script in resolve, it's going to actually read the environment and then get that from the app. But once again, if you're wanting to use this for free versions of resolve, use the app get fusion. Now to get the current comp you're in, there's also a few things you can do. We can do local comp equal to fusion, and we can either do dot current comp, and this is not getting a function now, this is reading property of the fusion object, versus this would be either a function or method of the app. But instead of this, we can also do a function or method to get the current comp as well. We can do get current comp. And this does the exact same thing as the other thing I just showed you. Does the exact same thing as this. They're just different ways to write it out. 
I would say neither of them are very common because if you're in that Fusion environment and if you just type in comp, it's going to know what you mean. For example, we can type in comp dot a tool name. So we can just say like text one for the text plus node. That's the first text plus node in the, in the comp. And, and if we dump this or print this to the console, we'll actually get the ID and all the properties about that node. Now, how do you figure out more about this? I'll have a bunch of links down in the description below, but if you're in DaVinci Resolve, come over here to help documentation and developer. This folder that it brings up is where you can find the Resolve scripting API information. We can also see a bunch of other APIs in here, including fuses, uh, DRFX fusion templates like macros, LUTs, OpenFX, workflow integrations, which is just the Resolve API, but in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And we have the scripting API. Ignore this, this was a testing thing. But we can open up this readme file and this contains all of the functions. It tells you a little bit about how you can maybe use the Python experience, about how to use all these different things. This, however, is a bit more confusing, kind of overly complicates the actual idea of understanding the code. This is not very beginner friendly. This is pretty good for somebody who knows a bit more about, how, about what they're doing, but not really good for somebody who's just starting out. I would say check out the links I have down below. They're a little bit more descriptive and helpful with a little bit more of examples that actually help you out with figuring out how to use this. But most of the documentation written and actually typed out for this is in a Python slash JavaScript format, which doesn't use the same syntax that you would see with Lua. So if it doesn't work the first time you try it, I would suggest if there's a period, swap it out with a colon. And if there's a colon, swap it out with a period. Generally, that's the most differences you'll see with the syntax. In other cases, you might actually be trying to use actual Python code. In that case, try to ditch that, look up and look more into it's kind of uh, see if that's actually Python. If it is not, maybe there's something else going on with your code that you maybe just need to debug. Regardless, that is a good way to get started with how to actually code for Lua for DaVinci Resolve scripting. If you have any more questions, please feel free to reach out on the Discord. If you ask questions on here on the YouTube comments, I won't really be able to answer them very easily with pictures and you know video information and all that kind of stuff. But if you want to take your learning to the next level, go ahead and start watching my series starting with this playlist right here. This is where I start teaching about Lua and also taking you on the journey of actual scripting with the API. So go ahead and take a look at this to learn a, bit, a little bit more about everything you can do there. But also watch this video over here to learn a bit more about macros and a little bit of the cool stuff that I've done with that over here. I'll be doing more stuff with macros in the future, but just for right now, let's go and check this out. It's pretty cool. I'll see you all in the next one. Happy animating.